Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning for our Botanical Recording for Beginners session as part of the Ellen Hutchins Festival 2020. Uh, today, we've got a few different speakers for you. I'm Sarah Pierce. I'm a BSBI Ireland officer. We also have Claire Herdman, who is Conservation Ranger for Barra. Uh, she's also the Vice County Plant Recorder for West Cork and co-organizer of the Ellen Hutchins Festival. And we have Jim McIntosh, who's the BSBI Iron, um, sorry, BSBI Scottish officer, and is joint vice county recorder for Mid Perthshire as well. He'll be helping us answer questions at the end. But I think we'll kick off with a little description of who Ellen Hutchins was and, and what the festival is from Claire. Uh, oh. Hi, yeah, I'm Claire Herdman, sorry, uh, uh, new to Zoom webinars. Um, so yes, I'm the co-organiser of the Ellen Hutchins Festival. Um, Ellen Hutchins was, she's widely regarded as Ireland's first female botanist, and she was born here in West Cork in Ballylickie on the shores of Bantry Bay. She was born in 1785 and tragically had a short life, dying just before her 30th birthday in 1815. Um, but she was really a pioneering woman. Um, I mean, many women of her class at that time, if they were interested in plants at all, would have been pressing flowers or possibly doing watercolours. But she ended up specialising in some of the most difficult branches of, of botany, studying um, bryophytes, that's mosses and liverworts, lichens and seaweeds. And she discovered several species new to science, which are named after her. So one of those is Hutchins Hollywood, Jubula Hutchensii. So the, the second part of the name is, is, is remembering her. Um, but really I'm mentioning her here today in her capacity really as a, one of the very early recorders, plant recorders, um, in, who's, who started recording in a systematic way. And she was asked to catalog the species in her neighborhood. And she recorded over a thousand species and she was, um, she was corresponding with botanists in the UK and because she lived in West Cork, she was just seeing species that they weren't seeing in the UK because we have very unique climate down here in West Cork. So there are, you know, species that the botanists in Britain would not have seen. So they really valued her input. Um, she didn't record in the way that we see today in terms of plant atlases and so on. She only tended to record the precise location of some of the rarer species such as stag's horn club moss is one, dwarf elder, um, but it's very nice as a, as a modern recorder to be following in her footsteps. So for instance, the Sags Horn Club Moss, she mentioned finding it at the summit of, of Knock Boy, which is Cork's highest mountain. And um, a few years ago, some mountaineers came across it there. They, they realized it was something unfamiliar and reported it to the BSBI. And so subsequently Rory Hodd from, and some of the rough crew of BSBI went up there and recorded that. And, yeah, it was the first time it had been seen in over a hundred years and the dwarf elder that I mentioned there, she mentioned seeing it in a hollow below the castle on Woody Island and that's still where it is today and virtually nowhere else in West Cork. So there's that lovely sense of following in the footsteps of someone who lived 200 years ago and uh, yeah, begin recording and following her footsteps because who knows in 200 years time people might be looking back at what we've been recording and uh, you know also marvelling over what we saw and where we saw it. So there's that nice part of plant recording of, of being a part of, of history. Um, this, I'm just doing one slide on Ellen, so, um, to, but to find more about her, go to our website there, www.ellenhutchins.com, and because she was also a botanical artist, um, she was just an extraordinary woman, so that website has everything you, you want to know about her, and also we have the festival ongoing at the moment, so if you look at that website, you'll see some of the other activities happening during the rest of the week. Um, I'm going to pass you back to Sarah, who's going to tell you a bit about the BSBI. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Claire. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, it's a charity for everyone who's interested in the flora of Britain and Ireland, as the name suggests. Uh, we were originally founded in 1836 at the Botanical Society of London and have since spread across Britain, Ireland and the Channel Islands, with the Irish branch founded about 55 years ago. Our goal is really to advance the study, understanding and enjoyment of wild plants and support their conservation. And we try to support the botanical community by providing botanical education and training through workshops and seminars and webinars like this now for the first time this year, um, and also some small grants. 
We do a lot of communication outreach activities, including field meetings, although sadly not this year, thanks to uh, the COVID situation, um, but also conferences and other events. We are active on social media, um, and we have a lot of different types of publications, including a scientific journal, county floras, and specialist plant ID books. We contribute to scientific research, helping to enhance our understanding of plant the distributions, ecology, and change over time. And of course, we record plants. That's a huge part of what we do. We have a network of Vice County recorders covering 166 Vice Counties around Britain. That's what the little map in the top corner is showing. Those divisions are the different Vice Counties. Um, and these recorders are really highly skilled volunteers who not only do a lot of recording themselves, but they also support local botanists in their area and they collate and validate, that is they check to some extent, the records that come into them for their county. And that really helps us to ensure that our database is as reliable as possible. So all of our records are as accurate as possible. Our database now contains millions of plant records, including over 5 million from Ireland alone. Um, and we're currently working on a new plant atlas for Britain and Ireland, which is based on recording efforts over the last 20 years. And we are now one of the world's largest contributors of biological records, and our data is used to inform scientific research and conservation. So if that sounds interesting, you can find out a lot more on our website, bsbi.org, and you can also find out how you can get involved or even become a member if you're interested. So what is today all about then? As recording is such a major part of what we do at BSBI, we want to kind of introduce you to, to what exactly recording is and why it's so important and then how you can contribute. So I'll give a little bit of an introduction to, to the, the why and the what before passing over to Claire again, who will go through the finer details of what information is needed to create a useful plant record um, and what you need to do to collect that information and then how you can submit your records either to us at BSBI or to another record center. So what is a botanical record? In a really general sense, any record is just a, a permanent account. In botany, we're talking about a permanent account of where a particular wild plant grew, when it was seen, and by who. And I think the two key points here to think about, uh, one is, is the permanent form. So if I go out and find an amazing rare orchid, and maybe I'll show a picture of it to some people or post it on Twitter, that's great, that's really interesting, it can enthuse people, but it's not useful. It's not permanent, people will forget about it, and it can't be used for research or other purposes. Where the opposite would be something like the little card you see at the bottom of the screen there. That's a recording card from the 1950s that was used in our original plant atlas in 1962. And to the right, we have the distribution map for cranberry, the same species, that I downloaded from our database this week. And that original record has fed into that map that's still there now. That gives us that permanence and that useful information so that that, that record isn't lost, so that information isn't lost, and so that it can be more widely used. The other thing I just wanted to point out is wild plants. So while it's really interesting to know what's been planted in your garden or what trees are growing in an arboretum, that's not really what we're interested in here. What we want are native plants or naturalized plants. So that's plants that have found their way to where they are on their own. They're spreading through the environment on their own. They're not being actively planted by humans. Now that doesn't mean we don't want to know what's in your garden, but we're much more interested in the daisies and dandelions growing in your yard that weren't planted rather than the irises or, or whatever you've got in your flower beds. So. so why are these records important? We spend all this time, we've got millions of them, what do we do with them? Well, they're really important in terms of understanding what plants are growing where so that we can try and protect rare species, monitor changes over time, track new plant arrivals, and just generally give us a much more clear state of what's happening in our environment help us understand and improve our understanding of uh, ecology and habitats. And then that information can go on to be used by decision makers. So in the next few slides, we'll just go through a couple of examples. 
So on the idea of rare plants, when we talk about rare plants, people are often thinking of things that are very, very rare. So something like Cornish moneywort, it's only found in a handful of places in Ireland. We need to know where those places are so that that can be protected. And that's really important because we obviously don't want to be losing species. But then we also need to think about species that are maybe a little bit less rare, but have very restricted distributions. So looking at the St. Patrick's cabbage, if you only ever look at plants in West Cork, you might not realize just how special that is. But when you start looking at the broader distribution map and see how few places it occurs, that tells us that it might need protection. It also can tell us by looking at where it occurs a bit more about what its needs are in terms of habitat and climate and also what the risks are to it so that we can think about how to, to protect it into the future. Moving on to plants that are uh, move, moving on to plants that are just coming in to Ireland, so plant introductions. Uh, looking at an example like Bilbao fleabane, if you go back to 2000, it had only been recorded in three places in Ireland. It was still very rare. Fast forward 20 years to now, and by plant standards, it's spreading really very quickly. You can see there's quite a lot of it across the south and east of Ireland already. And if you're able to zoom in a little bit closer on that, you'd see that a lot of those occurrences are uh, concentrated around population centers. So Dublin, Wexford, Waterford, Cork, they also tend to go along roadways and are found in waste ground. And that can tell us a little bit about not just where it's spread, but maybe how it's spread. So it seems likely that human activities are spreading that more than more natural causes. And that's important for us to understand as well. And it's not, all about rare plants either, it's really important that we understand where common plants are. So just a couple of examples, creeping buttercup and hawthorn, they're found basically everywhere. And so it can be very tempting to just not record them, to, to overlook them. But we need to know where they are for, for two reasons, I would say. First is they might not always be so common in the future, but we won't be able to track any changes in that, to understand any changes in that, unless we have the baseline data from now. So we do need those common plants to be recorded. The other element to consider is what we call benchmarking. So when you're trying to understand where rare plants are or are not, you need to understand what level of recording has been done. So if you're looking at a distribution map and it's completely empty, you don't know if that means no one's had a look for plants there or if there's nothing there. So by recording those common plants, it gives us an idea that yes, these areas, someone has gone and looked at what is present there. And without that information, we can't really say for sure that other plants aren't there or might not be there. So we need that sort of benchmarking as well. So there's just a few of the reasons why botanical records are so useful. I'm going to pass back to Claire now, who's going to go through the details of what you need for a record. Okay, so we're going to talk a bit about how you can feed into those atlases um, and starting with the basics. What is actually needed for a record? I mean, the obvious things, as, as Sarah has pointed out, we need to know who collected that record, not just for historical purposes, but also if we if a record gets sent in, it means we can check, you know, we can co contact that person, maybe just check up exactly where did they see it, <clears throat> um, you know, and clarify the information. Where was it found? Again, this is really important information, um, not just for the atlases, but also if it is a rare plant that we can protect it. Um, it's just a vital part of a record being actually a useful piece of information. Again, we need to know the date um, so we can track those changes. Um, and then finally, we need to know what it is you found. Um, the scientific name, <clears throat> excuse me, it can be a little bit difficult when you're starting out, but the trouble is with common names, um, the same plant can have like a local name. It can just be very confusing. It, it's not sort of definitive. So, but if you don't know the common name when you're out and about recording, that's fine. You can, you can, you can look up the scientific name when you get back, but it is important in terms of all the atlases, you'll see they always have the scientific name included there. And, and you do start getting familiar with those Latin names when you start recording. Um, so that's the absolute basic information, but often additional 
information is extremely useful. Um, so, for instance, I, I mentioned the, the stag's horn club moss, which was found by Ellen up on Knock Boy 200 years ago and, and subsequently re refound in recent years. And pictured here is Rory Hodd and, and Hannah Mulcahy, who are two uh, vice county recorders. And they're filling in what's called a club moss recording form. So it, it kind of typifies some of the additional information you may want um, when you find a, a, a plant. So you can record the habitat description. So in their case, they're on upland heath. Um, what other species are, are, are around there? Um, which again might give you an idea if you're in another location. Oh, I found the same species. I, this is a place I really should start looking out for that rare species. It just gives you an idea also of the particular requirements that species has. The population size. So again, for a rare species, this is particularly important. You're trying to get an idea of abundance. Is this species all over the site that you visited or is it just very restricted? Um, so you could be recording widespread or clumps or just a single plant and, and making a note of that. Um, in terms of the identification or, or, or submitting your record, photographs are really useful as a form of, of validation, but that's not always enough. Sometimes you will need to collect a specimen, but um, there's a BSBI code of conduct there because of course, if your plant is very rare or the population is very small, um, you should not be collecting. And if it's a protected species in Ireland, you, you shouldn't be collecting without a license anyway. But sometimes to identify, you will need just to pick a leaf, you know, if you're looking through your hand lens, just to identify the, the features to be sure that you have the right species. Um, and also, if you are a member of the, the BSBI, there is a, a referee system. So if you've got a species you're not 100% sure, it's quite rare, you found it's not been recorded in the area before, you will want to get that double checked. So uh, if you remember, you, you can send it to, to, to be validated or, or you can send it to your, your county recorder. But again, just be really careful, only collect a, a specimen if you need to and as little as you need to, you know, it may just be a leaf is, is all that you need. So, but generally now with modern photography, there's a, a lot of information can be gleaned from those. Um, description of key features, um, you don't always need to do this, but again, if you've got two very similar species, just making a note of, of what you use to separate it out so that the, the person validating the record can be sure that you, you were aware that there was two different very similar species and, and you looked at the, the relevant features. Um, the detailed description of the location, um, I mean, often we just give a, a grid reference, which is, is kind of fine, but even with the best GPS, it, it's still you know a few meters of error and if you're dealing with a really rare orchid that might just be on one side of a boulder or you know or, or for instance you may be at a cliff and a grid reference isn't going to be clear was your plant at the base of the cliff or was it in a crevice so that's the kind of information you might give you know on the cliff halfway up in a in a crevice so just a little bit of um information about exactly where you found your your plant and then as Sarah mentioned, the status of the, the species is important. Normally we're, um, the records we're really interested in are either native or naturalized. And by naturalized, as Sarah said, we're talking about things that have managed to spread themselves in the wild that have self-seeded and uh, gone beyond where they were originally planted. But that information is, there's also a subtlety to that because for instance, in West Cork, um, Arbutus, the strawberry tree is, is native to West Cork. Um, but it could, if you find it in Dublin, it was probably planted. So sometimes with the species, um, the to, to be sure that the distribution maps are showing the native distribution, you, you may just need to record um, clearly is, is it native at that location or, or, or was it planted? Um, so what do you need to actually go out and record? I mean, a lot of this is common sense, um, a notebook, pencils. Pencils are great because often in the Irish climate, this presentation generally, by the way, is, is aimed at Ireland, but I'm aware there's people who've tuned in who are from other countries. Um, but yeah, the Irish climate is pretty damp, so pencils are great because they work in the rain. You can get waterproof notebooks, which are really handy as well. Um, and then, of course, we have recording cards, and I'll go on to talk a little bit more about recording cards later in the presentation. Um, and then there are some of the monitoring schemes have, have an app which you can, so you can record directly onto your phone. Um, a way to find out where you are, so you can add that positional information for your record. So there's the old fashioned uh, maps. Um, you can use a GPS. Phones, like phones now, you can get GPS apps. 
or you know if you were out and you just spot a plant and you hadn't deliberately gone out recording you so you don't have your gps you could maybe drop a pin in google maps there's different you know so your phone is a useful way of, of identifying the location um and then there's also online grid reference finders so I, i'll mention those you know ways in which you can click on an online map and it'll generate a grid reference for you um a way to identify what you've actually found um i well, not going to talk a huge amount about identification guys because that's for another day but the bsbi um, website has information about which are the best identification guides um, and plant keys and, and online resources and, and has some reviews of, of apps um, so and, and again you, you you can maybe do a mixture of identification in the field if you're confident or in some cases you may be looking at your photographs or your little specimens when you get home um, and then of course you need um, tools to identify your to support the, your identification so um, Definitely when you're getting down to some species, you will need a hand lens to, to be sure that you've got the right species. Um, sample bags and to collect any little specimens and cameras are fantastic nowadays as well for recording purposes. So that's my um, the sort of kit I might head out with. So starting from the left there, a phone, as I've mentioned, it's great. You've got your camera in there. You can, can write notes on it. You could have your GPS app there. And then there's also the safety issue. So be aware when you're out recording um, that, you, that you are in a tell someone where you're going ideally you should be with someone else but always make sure you have a means of communication with you um, the weather writer clipboard there um, it just means you can put your form into it um, as we mentioned the Irish climate can be wet and you can write in it but if a simple cheap way those weather writers are quite expensive you can use just an ordinary clipboard put a paper bag over it um, maybe put a elastic band over it to stop it flapping in the wind <clears throat> or even you know sometimes I just print my recording card out onto card so it's, it's it has its own strength in terms of recording a times 10 hands lens is the is the basic um, level of lens that you need GPS, I, the next slide I'll just talk a little bit about GPS's if you want to head down that route. The Ziploc bag for samples, um, important, especially for things like aquatic plants, which often you do need to bring home to be sure of identification to bring home a specimen. So the Ziploc just means you can seal your bag, it's not leaking all over the place. And the other thing about taking, if you are taking a little specimen home, is just to label your bag rather than get home and wonder what was that, where did I collect it? So, um, you know, you could pop a little label in the bag just to, to make a note of where, of where that specimen was from. Um, the discovery map there, your notebook and pencil. These are two, the two identification guides I've put here are a great um, sort of start if you're, um, combination to start out with. You've got the Collins Wildflower Guide there, which has illustrations, you know, nice colour pictures. Um, so it's great to kind of get you into the right place. Um, but be aware that if you're recording an island, there's a lot more species in, in Britain than Ireland. So the advantage of the Irish flora there, it doesn't have the pretty pictures, but it only has Irish species. So if you're in the, the Collins Guide or whatever other guide you're using, um, always double check uh, does it actually occur in Ireland? And also, you can have species that are very common in Britain that are rare in Ireland and, and vice versa. So just be aware of those. And the the BSBI distribution maps can be a great um, tool as well, because again, you can, if you find something and just check, is that likely to be found in your area? And uh, just be really careful if it looks rare that you, you need to be, you know, very confident of your identification before you record that. Um, if in doubt, leave it out is, 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 is the mantra. And the, your recording card down in the corner, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, GPS, I'm not gonna talk a huge amount about this slide, but if people do feel that they'd like to buy a GPS, I have one, I find it much handier than using the phone for grid references. Um, it reduces some of the errors that you can make with trying to get grid references off your map. Um, you only need a very basic model um, it's a bit like computers, people can spend a lot of money buying something that they don't use most of the functions of. So just a very simple GPS will um, is, is all you need for, for just basic grid references. So the 
link there. I think the links aren't, you can't open them directly from this talk, but Sarah will be uploading that to the Irish BSBI webpage and you will be able then to click on the links and follow through to the, to the more detailed information. So, because what I'm showing there is just um, the first part of, of, a, of a information sheet that Jim McIntosh, who will be joining us for Q&A at the end, uh, put together to, to guide you. So um, you can look at that afterwards. Um, as I mentioned, you can also um, find grid references online. These are the Irish Grid Reference Finder is one, gridreference.ie. If you're in the UK, you'll find very similar sites. If you're using biodiversityisland.ie, it has a built-in feature when entering records, you can find a grid reference. Um, just be aware when you're recording grid references that you're recording something that's, that's usable. So in, you can see in this slide, that information there in orange, um, I mean, that's like a 10 figure grid reference. Normally we wouldn't need that level of information, but um, make sure you're just not recording ITM down here. Or if you do record la la latitude and longitude, it needs, we then need to convert it into an Irish grid reference. So this um, format is, is, is really what you're looking for. I sometimes use online grid reference finders when I haven't perhaps deliberately gone out recording, but so I don't have all my stuff with me, but I've seen something interesting at the side of a road, you know where you were, and then you can just, um, when you go home, look at the, the aerial photographs there and click and get your grid reference. Um, I've just put this in, it's a, a little bit of a plug for the Ellen Hutchins Festival. We have a little video there, um, how to use a hand lens. So again, when that's uploaded, you'll be able to have a look at how to use it. I, I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this, but if you're not, um, hand lenses do open up a whole new world of, of, of plant features. So. Um, definitely worth getting one and um, having a look at that video. And another little plug for Ellen Hutchins Festival, we have, we do actually have um, hand lenses for sale on our website with the Ellen Hutchins lanyard and it's the times 10 um, hand lens. So you've gone out there, you've um, gathering your record, you've made a note of where you recorded it, what it is and so on. So how do you actually submit that information? As Sarah said, how do you actually make that information useful rather than just um, impressing your friends with your beautiful picture of an orchid. Um, so a great way to get started is to submit directly to a monitoring scheme. So for instance, the BSBI has the garden wildflower hunt, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. The new year plant hunt, um, the picture on the right is a new year plant hunt in Glengariff. So they're, they're types of schemes that are getting you to look maybe at a specific time of year in the case of the new year plant hunt. So it's just the first two, three or four days of the year, what's in flower at that time. And it gives a really useful picture around Britain and Ireland of, of, of phenology, you know, how think, what's changing in terms of when things are, um, are in flower. Or the Biodiversity Data Centre in Ireland has a, um, an alien, invasive alien um, survey running at times, or a spring flower. So there's, those are great schemes to kind of feed into. And you know you're feeding into this, a kind of a bigger picture rather than just working in a vacuum. You can see what other people are recording and how it's feeding into the bigger picture. Um, you can also submit, you know, just if you found things yourself, um, when you're out and about, you can submit records to your local, a local or national recording centre. In Ireland, there's the Biodiversity Data Centre. Um, the website's Biodiversity Island, or CEDAR in the, in the north of Ireland. Um, and these, the, the data centres are fantastic for kind of occasional or one-off records. You know, when you're out and about, you've seen something interesting, and also they enable you to record all sorts of things. So while you're out looking at your flowers, you may also have recorded a shield, a shield bog, um, so that, you know, they're great for, for those kind of, kind of fairly random records that you find when you're out. Um, and then the final thing, and the thing we're really focusing on today is, is submitting your plant records directly to the BSBI. And this is really important for, for systematic recording. As Sarah said, like to really build up a useful picture, we need to know that people were recording, you know, that there was a sort of constant effort that people were recording all around the country or else, you know, you might have a plant that suddenly looks really common in Cork, but that's only because lots of people in Cork were out looking and nobody in Donegal was. So, you know, that, that's what the systematic recording is about, is, is about having that constant effort. And also the BSBI is really useful for, for, for rare, recording rare plants because there's a validation system, you've got experts on hand that you can um, contact that will make sure that what you've recorded is, is, is the correct species. Um, 
you know, data quality is really important. If in doubt, leave it out. It's very tempting when you've found something, you think it's rare to go, oh yeah, I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but yeah, look, I'll give it a go. But no, the, the data is only really useful if we can be sure the information is correct. So if in doubt, leave it out and go back another time and try again or, or bring an expert, someone who knows more than you with you and just make sure. But um, so um, as I said, one of the, the first way I mentioned there was to submit directly to a mon monitoring scheme. One that's running at the moment is the BSBI's Garden Wildflower Hunt. And it's great because it's on your doorstep. You don't need to do anything more than step outside your door. And if you don't have a garden, that doesn't even matter. Um, it's surprising how many plants you can find just in what people call waste ground, just your gravel yard, a stone wall. Um, but what we're really interested in is, is not the flowers that you've planted in your garden, not your, your pagonias or your dahlias, it's um, the wild plants. And by wildflowers, we're not talking just about flowers. We're you know, also interested in native trees, the grasses, sedges, rushes and ferns. So th those, whole th whole, those are all the groups that the, the BSBI is interested in recording, not just uh, the daisies and the dandelions. So it's simple survey to get involved with. There's an app you can use on your phone or you can go onto the um, website and you'll see there's an online recording form, which again has the basic information um, that you need to submit that we've mentioned before, the place, the date, your name and on what you actually recorded. And the great thing about monitoring schemes like this, there's usually sort of backup help um, in terms of identifying so identifying stuff. So you can either do that through the, the, the page here or go on to Twitter and you'll see BSBI is very active there in terms of helping people identify what they found. So, and the thing if you're recording, taking part in the survey is start looking closely. You'll be surprised how many wildflowers are actually in your lawn you know when you get down on your hands and knees you'll be surprised what's there and don't just look at the lawn make sure you look at the stone walls look at your hedgerow so you're trying to cover the different habitats within your garden and see how many flowers that you can find there and they don't need to be in flower um, you know it's, it's whatever you're able to identify you know you can record so that's a great one to get started with and hopefully you'll start doing it today um, the data centre, I won't go into a huge amount of detail here, just to say those are the links to the, the two national data centres here in Ireland. Um, they both have online recording forms and they're fairly self-explanatory when you go to those websites to, to work out how you, how you submit a record. This is the, the National Biodiversity Data Centres one. So again, you're starting to see the themes here of the, the basic information, name, date, your location, your grid reference, um, recording your habitat and a little bit you see down there at the bottom a little bit more information about this is like a strawberry tree so I've recorded a little bit of information about exactly where that is and on the biodiversity data center you can submit photos which again is great for someone trying to validate the records to be sure that you've recorded what you actually think you recorded. Um, so submitting plants to the BSBI um, if it's just if you're really just really starting there's the record a plant form, which is great just for a single plant. You're not sure what it is. Um, you, you can send it in there through the, the record a plant page and someone will get back to you on that. Um, the other method and is, is, is a really good one is to send um, records to your county recorder or your, your country officer. So in West Cork, I'm the county recorder or the country officer in Ireland is, is Sarah Pierce. Um, this is great for the systematic recording. And again, it's great if you can get beyond just sending an email with a single record. That can be useful in some situations, but really we encourage people to use the, the recording card, which I'll talk about now, or there's an optimized um, Excel spreadsheet, which enables you to, to enter the information as well. And the link there at the end is, is just, uh, if you follow that, you'll find who, your, who, who the people are that you can send your, your records to. And it's worth contacting people those people when you start recording as well, just to see, um, are there any schemes running? Are there particular areas or, or plants they'd like you to, to focus on? So systematic recording. So this is where we're getting beyond the random, I was out and I saw something interesting. With systematic recording, this is where you're deliberately going out to try and compile a species list for in a particular area for a particular reason. 
so Plant Atlas 2020 was running for the last 20 years and it was about um, mapping the distribution of species. So if you're trying to do that, and this is the, the same kind of principles are valid to a lot of, of, of this systematic recording. Um, the Plant Atlas was recorded mostly on a one kilometre square level and I, I'll talk about that in a minute, but the idea is that then you would visit all the main habitats in the area. You don't just go and record um, in, in, the, in the blanket bog, you'd also want to be looking at the lakes, the cliffs, coast, you know, try and um, look at all the habitats within an area so you're, you're getting the, the best um, species list possible for an area. And as I mentioned before, don't forget the, the car parks, the waste ground, the laybys, those things, you know, in terms of an atlas, those things that aren't special species are also really important in terms of recording. The systematic recording is also useful for things like um, site surveys so you could be out um recording in your you know for, for say a, a biodiversity plan in a local park or amenity area um the systematic recording could also be used for specific plant groups so for instance the bsbi was running um an aquatic plant survey you know some habitats can tend to get a bit neglected in the sort of general plant recording schemes because perhaps they're more difficult you know to record aquatic plants you you, you maybe need different equipment like a grapnel to actually throw out into the lake to get the deep water species. You may need to be snorkeling. So um, the, the aquatic plant systematic recording scheme might, you know, look at a, a map and then try and identify all the water bodies and make sure a representative sample of those are, are visited and, and surveyed. Um, and again, they could be used for, for monitoring purposes, looking at, you, you know, if you have a good species list, it means that you can identify changes. So, you know, if you record do your species list now and then in 10 years time it gives you an idea if you've done it systematically of what changes occurred. Systematic recording can also be used for, for rare plant surveys so if, if you can all see the picture in the top right that's uh, Pat Smiddy from East Cork and he decided to record sea kale which is a fairly it, it used to be on the floral protection order in Ireland it's a fairly rare plant and he systematically surveyed the whole coast of Cork looking for that plant so he identified you know the main types of habitat, the, the sort of shingle beaches that it's likely to be found in and visited all of those around the Cork coast. So, um, and, and, and that can be done in a similar way for other rare species. Um, and just, I mentioned there at the end, it's always worth talking to your county recorder to see what effort is needed. Um, because this, if, if it's for something like the Atlas, there's no, there was no point in everybody going to um, one particular place and everybody recording there, you know, it's about trying to distribute effort around the place but we're always really grateful for records and really delighted if people are interest in, uh, interested and want to send us records it was so useful for plant out this 2020 the people that were visiting um west cork people who lived in parts of west cork far from me who, who got involved it was just incredibly valuable to get those records um so the this is the kind of the basic um, format that um, BSBI recording cards work on. So um, just to, it, so it's very similar to the, to the online forms I was showing you earlier. So up in the, the top left, you've got your grid reference. Now, this is based on what's called a monad. And in the next couple of slides, I'll explain why, why that's a four figure grid reference. Um, you've got the vice county. So this is the West Cork one, H3. You've got your date, um, the place that you were recording. This is the, the reference for the, for the monad, the, the general habitats that were in that site. So again, we know it gives an idea of where you actually visited because again, somebody going back might find new species and it's like, oh, well, because these people, these are the habitats they looked at. They didn't look at um, upland heath or, or a, a cliff, you know, so it just gives an idea of, of where you went in the area and then the names of the recorders. Now this is what's called the, the, the front side of the form. On the back side there's a list of, of species which you can cross through, I'll show that in the next slide, but the front is really for recording extra information on plants that warrant it. So if you've got something rare or unusual um, you might want to record a bit more information about where it was, a longer grid reference so you can record like an eight-figure grid reference or even a ten-figure one so in terms of someone trying to refine it, it it's it's easier and again we, we talked about the population size so you know several clumps um, and then the, the status you know this was not a native species in this site it was had spread from a garden for instance 
so um, hopefully that's all explanatory, but yeah, we will be answering questions at the end. And these forms are available on the BSBI website. Um, and uh, so this is the backside where it can look a bit daunting. So what you've got, this is, I don't know if you can see up there, this is the list optimized for the Vice County of West Cork, which is H3. So there's around 600, five or 600 species listed there that are the ones you're most likely to, to find in the county. Um, looks a bit daunting because there's a lot of them and also they're in the Latin names. But as I explained, we really do need the Latin names to be sure that we have the right species. But, you, you know, once you start using it, 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 you start getting kind of familiar with it. Um, and if you're using the recording form, this is how you actually record which species you saw. So rather than on the front side that you saw where I'd handwritten the name, this avoids that. You've got a list in alphabetical order, so it's easy to find where your plant is. You just put a line through the name of the plant. Don't obscure the number because what happens is you then send that form to your vice county recorder or to your county, your county, your country officer and the data is inputted into a, a soft, through software called MapMate and it's done through the numbers. So I just enter, I, all I have to do is enter five and press return. I don't have to be writing the whole Latin name. So it's important that the, the person entering the data can still see the, the names here, the numbers here. If you make a mistake, this is what to do, is just put a cross at each end of, of the name. So that's clear, you, you made a mistake, you didn't mean that record to be included. Um, and then down at the end, it, there's a very useful um, link there on the BSBI website again, just to give you a bit more information about how to use recording cards. So I mentioned, I've been mentioning terms like monads. Um, so what, what is a monad? So if you remember back to the form two slides ago, we had this, um, what I call a four figure grid reference. Um, so that's describing a one kilometer square. And that is, was the basic recording unit of the, the plant atlas. Um, so how do you find the number of your monad? Um, it's same, similar to finding any kind of grid reference. The, the, the tip is crawl before you walk. So you go along the bottom axis first and you'll see here all the numbers. So you've got to 99. So that's the first part go up the side, you've got 35, and that's the second part. And then be careful with the number, the, the letter in front. So here you can see there's V, so that's the one in the front. If I was over on this side of the line, I'd be going into W. So that's one place it's easy to make mistake in, in, in somewhere like West Cork, where half of West Cork is, is the front part of the Irish grid reference is V, and the eastern part of West Cork, it, it's W. So that's your, your monad. So that, for the atlas, that's where the species list would the level they were generated for. Um, but in terms of the atlas, you'll see a lot of the information is displayed at what's called tetrad level, which is a two kilometer by two kilometer square. Um, I won't go into too much detail on that, except to just say that that's what a tetrad is. And then the hect, some information is displayed at hectad level, which is your, your 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. And it's the same principle. Walk, crawl along, you've got your nine, go up, you've got your three, so that's your your, your hectare there. And then if you record in the grid reference for a, a single point for your plant, um, it's more detailed again. So that little dot, I'm going along the bottom. So I'm on 97 there. It's literally on the line. So it's O, it's all zero, sorry. And then up here, 34. And again, it's on the line, so it's zero. So if, for instance, it had been here, <laughs> this is getting very complicated. You can read this. Um, if it had been here, you'd go along, it'd be 97.5 and then 34.5. So those bot next two figures would be five if it was up here, say. Um, but again, you'll get familiar with that system. And actually the discovery maps, I think they actually tell you how to find a grid reference as well. If you're using one, There's, you know, down at the bottom, it'll tell you how to do that. Um, and also this Ordnance Survey Island link will tell you how to generate a grid reference if you are using a map. Um, so I'm sure there'll be a few questions on that if, I, <laughs> if you're all still awake. Um, so all this, all these informations that you, you record and send in, they end up in, in what's in, in, a, in a database. Um, and uh, it's important to know what vice county you're in. So this is just a quick tool. If you go on to the look at the database, I mean, 
this is where you can generate the maps, the distribution maps that Sarah was, was showing earlier. So if you're interested in the distribution of a particular plant, you can look at the map section and get a, a distribution of, of, of any plant and, and you'll get an idea of how recently it was recorded in your area and so on. Um, but if you've got a grid reference, you can use this tool, you do drop down, look up grid reference, and it'll tell you what, if you enter your grid reference, you'll see what Vice County you were in there. So it's telling you I was in H3, it's telling you which hectad, which tetrad, which monad, and then the actual grid reference there. And it's showing me on a map where it is. So that's all a bit technical, but it, it can be useful in, in certain um, situations, just to be sure if you're sending records to a Vice County recorder that you were in the right, um, area to, to you know in terms of sending it to the right person what you can also do with this is you know if you're going out recording you might want some idea of who what was found in that square before in that area before so if you click down again on the tools um, you can generate um, a, a taxon list so the next slide will show you that so this is showing you every species that was recorded in that um, Tetrad, and, and as the, you know that, that's the only level you can look at for um, if, if you're a, a member of the general public. But you'll get some idea of the kind of species that you might be looking out for in your area, and, you, and you'll also find out if, if, if what you recorded is new to that square. And as I said that you know the, the distribution maps are fantastic for just getting an idea of um, whether what you found is rare or likely to be found in, in that area. I mean, a lot of this is just going out exploring not just exploring physically out in the ground, but exploring the BSBI website and, and the, the database just to see what tools are available to you and um, what use they are to you. So that just to summarize all that information, um, what is needed for a complete record, who, who recorded, where they recorded it, when, um, I can't, and where, uh, what to record. Again, just to stress, we're really looking at native and naturalized plants. So. Um, that, that's the important things to focus on, you know, just be aware if, if you know, don't be recording things that were just kind of randomly planted. Um, where to record anywhere, like sometimes people think we should be going to the Burren or um, special areas of conservation. No, I mean, it, as, as Sarah said, common plants are equally important to record. We, you know, we want to record things before they become rare. We need to know those, those trends and, and it doesn't have to be good habitat. Laybys, car parks are a great place to start. Um, submitting rec records is important. Uh, it's, it's just so useful for us and, and land managers to know what's where, um, how things are changing. So if you're out there, just do get those records and we just value every single one. Um, getting started, the garden wildflower hunt is a great way to start, but whatever way you want to start is, is, is valid too. But I, I really recommend starting into the garden wildflower hunt because you can do it today, just step outside and, and begin. And help is available. The BSBI website is full of fantastic resources. Um, your county recorders are here, Sarah, your country officer is here. So there's a lot of help out there and, and other botanists are always really willing to help. You know, we're always just really encouraged when anybody is interested and, and very, yeah, would really like to help you if we can. So um, that's me finished for now. I'm going to just hand back to Sarah, who's going to just talk a little bit more about uh, the BSBI and the resources and how to get involved. Thanks, Claire. That was, uh, that was a really good overview, um, starting with the simple four W's, which is, is all that is absolutely required for, for a record, but going into a lot more detail to make it a lot more useful. Uh, so that was great. Hopefully you found that interesting and, and you're willing to give recording a try either through one of those monitoring schemes like the Garden Wildflower Hunt or, or just going out on your own wherever you're interested, whether that's uh, up a mountain or, or in a car park. Uh, we'd love to hear what you find. Um, as Claire said, lots of resources. Uh, all of these underlined sections are links, and I will be posting this on the BSBI Ireland webpage, um, and I'll send a link to you tomorrow so that you can uh, access this and, and look at those more closely if you'd like to. Um, the BSBI resource page is a great place to start. There's lots of information on there, including links to the GPS advice, um, species lists, all sorts of stuff on there. There's also a really nice uh, beginner's guide to recording 
it's it's a short document that's written in a nice conversational style that goes through these main points again. Uh, so that's a really useful thing to have a look at, nice and short and sweet. Um, we now have a BSBI YouTube channel and one of the playlists is the biological recording playlist and there's some videos on there from the Center for Ecology and Hydrology and the Field Studies Council that again go through the basics of recording for you. Um, if you want a recap in, in sort of five and six minute chunks. Um, and then again there's the recording cards that, that Claire showed and there's links to where you can download the recording card for your county. There's also spreadsheets so if you go out and write your records in a um, notebook or something and then you want to put them into a form that'll be easier for your recorder to upload to the database there's spreadsheets you can use that that are really useful because they've already got the species list there. So you start typing in the species name and the rest of it comes up and it puts in the common name for you and that kind of thing. And it helps to avoid typos and, and other issues that can then can, can cause some problems for the database. And one thing that, that was only touched on very briefly is the idea of safety in the field. Um, we're very conscious that some people like to go out into more remote areas and that sort of thing. But wherever you're going, we want you to keep safe. And so there's just a, a really short sort of one page document there giving tips on, on how to stay safe in the field and, and what you should have with you. So it'd be great if you have a look at that. So how else you can get involved? Um, if you're interested in learning more about botany or recording, um, or even if you just want to meet some like-minded people who enjoy looking at plants, you might want to consider joining BSBI. Um, in a normal year, we run lots of field meetings around Britain and Ireland where you can go and, and meet up in a group and, and record plants, and, and they're a great learning opportunity and a lot of fun. Unfortunately, we had to cancel them this year, but fingers crossed we'll be back on next year. We also run lots of training courses, both in person in, in most years, and now we're, we're hopefully going to be running more of these sorts of webinars. Um, and lots of other things, as I was discussing a bit at the beginning, um, grants and just being able to support our work as well. Beyond that, there's also lots of local groups you can get involved with. BSBI runs local groups and you don't necessarily need to be a member to get involved with those. There's a list of the ones for Ireland there. Um, and most of them are regional or county based. However, we also have the Rough Crew, which, which I think Claire mentioned briefly, which is a group of, of people who are a little bit more intrepid who, who go recording in remote places like islands and up mountains. So that's a really interesting one for those who are a little bit more adventurous. Um, outside of BSBI, there's lots of local natural history societies and other environmental groups to get involved with. I've just listed a couple there that, that quickly came to mind. But if you have a look in your local area, I'm sure there's going to be others there. And, and botany is a lot more fun out in a group sometimes. Uh, and it, it helps with learning. I, I learned more every time I go out with a group. So I definitely recommend it when it's safe to do so. And um, as we know, there's a lot of restrictions in place at the moment. A lot of things have been moved online. So now is a great time to start looking at opportunities on social media as well. BSBI has Twitter and Facebook for both the organization as a whole and Ireland specific accounts. So please get in touch with us there. Um, and if you are on Twitter, I definitely recommend you check out Wildflower Hour, which is the hashtag at the bottom there. Um, it's every Sunday night from 8 to 9 p.m. and a really great opportunity to share what you've found, see what other people are finding throughout the week. And there's lots of ID help there as well. Lots of BSBI members and other botanists are involved in that. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And I think that's it from us today. Uh, all we can say is hopefully you found it useful. And now today even, despite a bit of rain, at least where I am, you know, get out and, and have a look, see what you can find, see what you can record, and let us know how you get on. And thank you very much for, for taking time out of your Saturday morning to join us. We will have a look now at the Q&A. So if you have any questions, just type them in there and, and we'll have a bit of a discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah and uh, Claire. That was a great talk. Um, we don't have too many questions, but can, can I just warn everyone, if you don't ask uh, me questions, uh, I'll ask you some questions. 
and give you some homework to do. Uh, <laughs> so um, the first question is, uh, do NBDC, National Biodiversity Data Centre Records, go to the ESBI? If you'd like to answer that one. I'll answer that one if that's okay. We do eventually get them. Um, we do have some, some data sharing between the different organizations, um, but we would get them, you know, maybe once a year, it's not live. And so it's not something that, that our other recorders would be able to maybe follow up immediately. There's also not the same type of validation process. So in particular, if there's something that you think might be quite rare, it's useful again to bring it to our county recorder's attention sooner so that we can make sure that that is that is accurate and and then also follow up with, with what might need to be done next. But yeah, we do do data sharing between us, um, which is, is definitely a useful thing. <laughs> it's generally much better to submit records to BSBI recorders uh, because they, they can give you feedback on those records and g it gives you a chance to develop a relationship with them. But perhaps without, you might end up going out in the field with them uh, in a local group or one-to-one. -one. So, so that's a, it's a great learning opportunity. If you're getting serious about recording, there's no better way than to get out with other botanists, particularly vice county recorders. And they might seem a bit scary uh, because of fantastic botanists, but generally they're very keen to teach and uh, they love um, throwing off their knowledge <laughs> um, in a nice way. So, so yeah, do, do, do get in touch with uh, Vice County Recorders. Uh, Sarah, are, are there any more questions? I don't think there are. Well, there were a couple that we kind of touched on uh, through the session, but um... Somebody was saying about the Biodiversity Data Center app is they find it really useful when they're in the field and, and is BSBI considering developing that sort of an app? Um, yes, the, the BS, I, was, I was speaking to our database man yesterday about this very question and we are working on a, a, an app. Um, we currently have the apps for the garden wildflower hunt and the new year plant hunt. But, uh, he's developing a more general app and ideally you'd like an app that you could actually speak to your smartphone and it would use voice recognition technology. And, and, and the technology is definitely there to do that, but the problem is those pronunciation of those scientific names is really tricky. Everyone pronounces scientific names in different ways. Um, and getting a phone to recognise those words is quite tricky, but we are working on it. Meantime, uh, for one-off recording, I, I use um, the GB Grid Reference Worker app. Now, there's an Irish Grid Reference Worker app as well. You pay a small amount, it's three quid or something, one-off fee for that app, and it allows you to uh, make ad hoc records uh, and it'll attach a good reference and a date, and you can email or text that record to, to uh, a friend or yourself even. You don't even need a signal, because it, it, once it's in your phone, it's recorded. So, so it, it's a great way of, of making a record uh, if you come across something unusual in the field but, and you don't have paper and pen to hand. Um, the other thing I was going to say, this is the homework bit. <laughs> well, hold on, Jim. Before you get on to that, I did want to say something else about oh, the, yeah, sorry, the app on. situation. Yeah, hopefully BSBI will have their own app at, at some point in the future and we'll keep you updated. Um, for people who do use the, the Biodiversity Data Center app, um, I've used it for, for non-plant records, for invertebrate records, and, and it is really useful. One thing to watch out for, um, if you're using it live in the field, it's fantastic. It automatically gives you the grid reference. But if you're, say, recording your, your finds in a notebook and then uploading them later, it will automatically use the grid reference for wherever you are at the time that you create that record in your, in your account. So there have occasionally been problems where, where people are finding all sorts of things or appear to find all sorts of things in their garden, which were actually recorded elsewhere. 
So if you're recording things in a notebook or something and uploading them later, make sure you use their web form so you can select the correct location rather than using the app directly. So just, just thought I'd point that out because it's something that we've, we've seen happen. Okay. Uh, right, meantime, uh, another question has come in. Uh, uh, how often should you submit a record from the same site? And that, that's quite an appropriate question because we've just finished a 20 year um, project to record for Atlas 2020. Uh, Sarah, would you, would you like to answer that? I'll come back and, and perhaps <laughs> say, say some more. I think that's actually quite a, a tricky one because it kind of depends on, on what it is. I mean, if you've recorded a, a tree once this year, you don't really need to go out next week and do it again, but other plants where the, the phenology changes, you, you might want to be looking more more frequently, or certainly things like orchids, which can show up at a site one year and not the next. It's it's interesting to, to be able to track that. Um, Claire, as a, a vice county recorder, what's your opinion on that? Uh, well, yes, like you say, I think it depends on the, the plant. I mean, the atlas is, has been like a 20-year atlas, so as long as it was recorded once in the 20 years, it appears in that, that atlas but for, for rare species in particular um, they can come and go so and it could be really useful for monitoring rare plant populations some of those schemes do rely on more frequent monitoring even up to annual monitoring just to you know because again that feeds into actually protecting the population you know if it's monitored every year you know because then you might also be recording information about threats to it you know like rhododendron uh, coming in or whatever you know so it just it allows you to take action if required so yeah it depends on the species but um it's better really i mean if you're recording to move just general recording to move into a new area rather than re-recording the same site year in year out unless you're doing that for a particular purpose there is one exception to that uh, if you're trying to get a full list for a site then you need to record it more than once in a okay. year so typically for Alps 2020, we would ask recorders to um, record in spring and summer, or maybe spring and autumn, or summer and autumn. So twice in a year in two different seasons, and that way you, you get a full uh, uh, cross-section of the, the species uh, in the square as possible. And I guess if you, if you look at something like the Garden Wildflower Hunt, the way that, that just started this spring, um, but when it's being analyzed by, by Kevin, our, our science officer, he's going to be looking at what was recorded before midsummer and what was recorded after uh, to kind of get an idea of, of when things are, are mm. appearing in our gardens. Um, and so that's a case where, yes, it's great if you've only done it in the spring or if you didn't do it in the spring and you do it now, that's fantastic. But if you have both, then that's even better. Um, or something like the New Year plant hunt where we're trying to look at uh, phenology and see how that might be changing. You might want to go and record at the same place each year during that time period and then you'll be able to see how it changes from year to year. So again, it, it depends on the purpose of your recording. Yeah, I mean certainly with the New Year plant hunt in Glengariff, we've, we've followed the same, we've been following exactly the same route every year, so it means that we can compare year to year. So that's really interesting, you know, because it gives us some idea then of, of yeah, was it weather related? Um, yeah, so it is, it is interesting in some surveys to keep repeating the same site year in, year out. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, uh, this is the homework bit, uh, because <laughs> no more questions have come in. So uh, I'd like everyone to work out uh, what your good reference is. <laughs> Uh, so a bit of practice on, on grid references uh, and then enter that in the BSBI database grid reference lookup. So find out your vice county and then click that link which gives you the full list of all the species that have been recorded in your two by two in the tetrad that you live in and then go out and see if you can re-record them. <laughs> That's great. You, you, you won't get them all. <laughs> but you, it, 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 it gives you an idea of what's there uh, so, and, and what you're more likely to find. Of course, you might find things that are not there, and the bicycle recorder would be interested in, in hearing 
ever about that. Um, either they're very good records or you maybe made a slight identification error, but they can give you some feedback on that. So, so give that a go. Uh, the, the, you don't need to log on to do that basic search on the database. Um, you can just look up the, the uh, website, uh, follow the instructions on, on the YouTube video and um, uh, get that list up. But by the way, when you see the list, it has um, uh, all the species listed and the date after the species is the date of the last record made mm -hmm. in the square uh, within the last 20 years. Uh, so it'd be good to get some more 2020 records there. And you could help to do that. <laughs> so what, what, once you're recorded in your local square, um, but perhaps on a, a record card, um, send that record card to your vice county recorder. And you can, again, the, the details are in the um, in the YouTube video of how you do that. Uh, all, all the contact details are on the BSPR website, um, and uh, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> and actually on that point, Jim, we'll know if you did it because like in the distribution maps, pre-2000 is red. And so anything from 2020 onwards will show up as green. So what we want to see is lots of little green squares popping up around the place to show that there's new records coming in. <laughs> yeah, this hey, at least one person has put in the Q&A that they'll do it. So uh, we'll Great. see how it goes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, since I don't think any other questions have come through, I think we'll leave you with your homework. Uh, thank you very much for spending your Saturday morning with us. Uh, thanks a lot to Claire for, for pulling together that presentation for us and to Jim for uh, helping answer questions and giving us homework. <laughs> um, and I will, as I say, post the presentation on the BSBI Ireland website and tomorrow you'll get a link from us um, asking for a bit of feedback on the session and, and it'll also include a link to the BSBI Ireland webpage so you can find that nice and easy and then click through all the links as needed. And I think that's all for now. Great. Okay. Thanks Bye. a lot, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.